Well, hello everyone. I hope that you each are doing well today and that in the spring of, uh, of this year that you're getting to enjoy some of the outdoor opportunities, even though we're cooped up too much. Uh, I know that it is so, so helpful and such a blessing to get outside, get some sunshine, get some fresh air, and I just want to encourage you guys uh, to all do that. I know for me, that is uh, a must-have for myself, and so I just want to encourage that little bit for you before we get started. And uh, my name is LaTanya Schmidt, and last time I introduced a series that I wanted to start, so today is our first uh, part one of the series that I have introduced previously, which is about guarding your heart slash thoughts from distorted thinking. So I want to uh, share with you the first one that uh, came uh, to mind. It's something that actually I do struggle with too. And so I thought it'd be a good one to start off with since I definitely can identify with it. Uh, guarding your heart, guarding your thoughts from distorted thinking. So Proverbs 4, 23 is going to be pretty much our theme text throughout the series. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And remember to guard means to keep, to watch, to have diligence over. Uh, we want to protect, to maintain. We don't want to conceal things and hide things away. We don't want to let ourselves become deceived about something or to deceive others about something and uh, to keep things hidden or anything like that. So we want to make sure that we are doing our part to uh, just participate in an active way to guard our hearts. And God has given us the ability to do that, to retrain our brain if we start and have had a habit of uh, some distorted thinking. And I love, again, we're going to keep coming back to this verse again, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we are to cast down, okay, throw out, put away, uh, put down, imaginations. And imaginations, like I defined earlier, is cognitive distortions, is distorted thoughts. And we are called to then exalt every high thing um, that is of God and to uh, put down anything that goes against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So today's our first day of utilizing this frontal lobe activity that we're going to do by analyzing a Bible uh, story through the formula that we talked about before, distorted thought, identifying that distorted thought, and then looking at the true thoughts and then applying it by seeing what spiritual key uh, took the disappointment into an appointment. And and so I will, uh, near the end, talk about identifying and correcting some thinking errors and uh, some negative automatic thoughts um, just to kind of help you have some light bulb maybe moments as you're going through your day. I know it helps me. And so I definitely uh, want to give you some of those tips as well. So we are going to look for the true thinking as we see and identify the distorted thinking and then take it deeper into that level of spiritual key, turning disappointment into appointment. So let's get started. I hope you have your Bibles ready and anything that you wanna write with, uh, take notes with. Uh, those are definitely great things to have handy during this time together. So put it on pause if you need to. And little plug um, before we go any further, just hit subscribe. Uh, to this Guard Your Heart series and also to our Highland Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, page here on YouTube. And so there's my little two cents plug. I uh, forgot to do that earlier, but I wanted to make sure to encourage you to do that. There are so many things that others are also putting on and sharing, and I know that they are a blessing as well. So just wanted to encourage you to do that. And uh, that way, every time you get, there's a new... Um, a new post done, you can get that notification and you can see uh, what's new and, and enjoy those um, pieces that are really great for spiritual um, just engagement and especially during this time when we all need to keep building and encouraging each other up. So let's get started 
And before we go any further, why don't we start in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, and I covet your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for being with us during this time. Reveal yourself to us. Reveal your truth and continue to help us to see what you need us to see and to hear and and to uh, apply to our lives uh, these truths that are meant for all of us to take in. But I know each one of us have specific needs. And so I just ask that you meet us and fill us with your spirit and, and go through this study time with us and reveal yourself in a mighty way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so open your Bible to Genesis 25. We're going to start there together. And this is an interesting story where I'm going to kind of keep you leaving. I'm going to keep you in the dark for a few more minutes about which type of um, distorted thinking we're going to be focusing on today. And so I am going to reveal that here in a little bit later, okay? But Genesis 25, I'm going to start in uh, verse 22. And if you notice um, where the story is, this is a story of, of um, two boys. And you will quickly recognize the story. And so it is going to be a fabulous uh, study to, to really dig in deeper. So Genesis 25, verse 22. We're going to read a few verses together. And... Uh, this is where, of course, um, there is a pregnancy that is going on, but the children struggle together within her. So here we have mother who is pregnant, and she says, if all is well, why am I like this? Now, I don't know about you, but I remember my pregnancies and wondering what in the world is going on inside, and I only had one. <laughs> So imagine twins, and I know a lot of you have had twins, so uh, I know that you probably can very much identify with this. So if all is well, why am I like this? And she went and inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, those are not typical words. So, definitely a very much key to our story. Verse 24. So, when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So, they called him, called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out and his hand took a hold of Esau's heel. Like, hang on, I'm coming with you. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when his wife bore them. Now, we're going to jump to another piece of the story. In Genesis 25, verse 31 to 33, this is what it says. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me this, swear to me as of this day. So Esau swore to him and sold his birthright right to Jacob. Now, ah, quite the, the template for our distorted thinking. And these boys have quite the sibling rivalry going on. Uh, one of the worst business deals in ancient history actually resulted as a, as a distorted thought process called all or nothing thinking. That was some very expensive bowl of soup. Don't you agree? <laughs> The Bible says that Esau was a great hunter and any would-be target of his would, would be doomed when uh, within range of his bow. But you know, Esau had some bad hunting days too. One day when Esau returned from a very frustratingly fruitless, uh, those are some key words there to think about, hunting expedition, he found himself totally famished. Again, another 
uh, thought process there I want you to remember. Perhaps he was so focused on chasing elk that he forgot to nibble on some berries along the way. And I'm sure he would know what was good to eat and what wasn't good to eat and had all of his good survival skills at the ready for him to be aware of that. But he didn't do that. And at the end of the day, he was left with nothing but a very painfully empty stomach. With his blood sugar dropping, Esau had one thing on his mind. He wanted food. Now, who here has been hangry? <laughs> and it doesn't seem like anything um, can get in the way when you're hungry. And uh, nothing else really matters when you're hungry. And we notice that with babies. I mean, they're going to cry and they won't stop crying until they get to get some food. If that's why they're crying, of course. But when it's time to eat, they want to eat. And uh, es Esau was no different. Uh, not that he was a baby at this time, of course, but and I know we can all identify. He wanted his food and he wanted it fast. But unfortunately for Esau, the closest thing to fast food in, in that particular situation happened to be the outdoor kitchen of his twin brother, Jacob. All right, so to fully understand this, this story, you have to know that Jacob and Esau like I said earlier, were the ultimate sibling rivals. So much so that they had started wrestling right in their mother's womb, like the Bible talked about earlier that we just read. And the issue at stake then was who was going to come out first? Esau won the initial battle, but the Bible, Bible records that Jacob came out with his hand on Esau's heel. I think that's very interesting. It mattered a great deal which twin came out first because their father Isaac was a very rich man and the firstborn born would receive the very coveted birthright. The son with the birthright would be the next leader of the home and receive a double portion of his father's inheritance as well as an additional spiritual blessing. And those are huge things in um, those days uh, to have not only just the inheritance, but the spiritual blessing. Now back to our story, where we find Jacob, who's a forward thinker, who had been plotting to wrest the birthright from his brother for years. And then Esau, a spontaneous sort, doesn't really seem to think about and plan for anything, only seems to care about the present, okay? So kind of some differences there, and we know Siblings are usually opposites, usually um, have very different, uh, very uh, different personalities and what they bring to the table and complementary uh, sometimes and then other times um, not very complementary. So Esau was on his way home when he passed his brother's fire where Jacob had just cooked up a steaming pot of soup. Esau collapsed in front of the fire. Can you imagine? Can you just see it? He's, he comes across Jacob and then he's like, oh, wow, I am famished. And he's literally begging for food. Jacob saw his big chance at this moment and offered to sell Esau one heaping serving of lentil soup in exchange for the birthright. And although the inheritance was vastly more valuable than the dinner, Esau didn't flinch for a moment. <laughs> He probably didn't have the energy to flinch, and besides, he was totally overcome with his bout of all or nothing thinking. And this is what he says as a result of that distorted thinking. What good will the stupid birthright do me if I'm dead anyways? Huh. In his cognitively distorted state, Esau saw things only in black or white, lentils or death. Kind of take note of those thoughts. Though he was not, uh, although he would not have died from hunger for weeks, he convinced himself that he would, and that was what mattered. In the absence of a notary public, Jacob made Esau raise his hand and commit to a solemn oath before heading over with the beans. So, now to our dissecting the story. The distorted thoughts. Did you hear them along the way? Did you see them as you were reading? 
we've got several things that really pop out to me and um, I know that I don't know it all. So if you come up with your own, please add them to the list, okay? Uh, this is definitely not me being an expert. I'm sharing what I know and I'm happy to. And um, this is definitely, anytime you, you study the Bible, there's more to it. There's always more. So please add what the Holy Spirit is, is impressing upon your heart. Uh, above and beyond what we come up with here. Okay, so my list of distorted thoughts that came, that just really stuck out to me first. The first one was that frustratingly fruitless hunting expedition. So poor Esau, that's how he saw it. That's how he thought about it. And, you know, definitely how we think about things is how we feel about things. And then we just make that the new truth. So it was frustratingly fruitless, nothing, nada. He had nothing. As a result, you know, he had nothing to cook, nothing to make, and he had nothing to eat during that expedition. And so he was totally famished. So think of that word. Um, you know, anytime we use totally uh, those, those kinds of words, uh, we're going to get to that a little bit later, but just know that that's a word that's key to understanding how we take ourselves, how, how uh, Esau took himself to all or nothing thinking. And then he had one thing in mind, okay? How many of us ever get uh, to that point of, you know, just a one-track mind? Uh, sometimes we give ourselves a little pat on the back about, oh, she's a one-track mind person, uh, or he's got one-track mind. You know, like that can be a good thing. Well, depends on how we're using it. He wanted food, was his one-track mind. Now, Esau was spontaneous and only cared about the present. And so that um, is also contributing to his distorted thinking. And then literally begging for food is the next piece. I mean, so he's he's not just thinking, he's behaving in this distorted thought, okay? He's, he's adding to that layer, that reinforcement of all or nothing thinking. And anytime we do that, that really does uh, deepen that thought uh, even more ingrained into us as the person. And so that begging was, was very much a deepening of his all or nothing thinking. So he was totally overcome by his bout of all or nothing thinking, saying, what good will the stupid birthright do me anyways if I'm dead? Thinking lentils, death, those, that was his option. That was what he came up with for this is, this is all he has to choose from, all or nothing. No, he would not have died for hunger, from hunger for weeks. He convinced himself he would. And that was what was mattered. And I don't know about you. I, don't, I, I am assuming you know, just like I know, that science shows that we can go a little while without food. Now, we definitely can't go as long without water, but we can definitely go a little while without food um, and we won't die. So the next thing we want to look at. Okay, so those were just just my quickies about distorted thinking. So add to that what you like as well. Um, next, true thoughts. So what is the true thoughts in this Bible story, Esau and Jacob? So I just alluded to the fact that he would not have died from hunger for weeks. Okay, so that is the true thought. Anytime we have a distorted thought, what is great to do is to flip it somehow and, and see what that flipping looks like to come up with a true thought. So that's, that's pretty much what you can do with this. So this is what you're going to start to hear as we go through what the true thoughts are in this story. Um, also, the true thought is the inheritance was vastly more valuable than the dinner. So that wasn't a fair trade, was it? Not even Stephen whatsoever. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that Jacob was realizing that, you know, he was really taking advantage of his brother in that situation. You know, sibling rivalry. Have you ever traded something with your, with your brother or your sister and you knew that, ooh, I know I'm getting the better end of the deal. They don't quite understand, know what, 
uh, the value is of something, uh, you know, as parents, I'm hoping to have trained my kids a little bit more about making sure everything's fair and even if you're tra trading. Um, but we haven't had much of that in our situation and, and all, but I do remember thinking those things when I was a younger sister thinking, Hmm, you know, is this an even trade or not? And I think, uh, sometimes we can, we can be honest and realize and recognize that sometimes we're not always fair with one another. So this is definitely how it's coming out in the story. After eating and drinking, in verse 34, Esau got up and left. So this is uh, a continuation of, of what has happened in, in this story. And Esau despised his birthright. So I am, I am thinking that he didn't care about his birthright. It did not have the same value to him as it did to Jacob. Jacob really valued, really wanted that spiritual blessing that I think, you know, who doesn't want, you know, an inheritance, but he really wanted the spiritual blessing. Now we're going to come to this, um, a little bit later with some, um, with some thoughts that I have, uh, gathered up from one of my favorite authors, but she brings out that none need abandon themselves to discouragement and despair. That is a huge true thought that we need to grab a hold on in our, our own lives and then um, recognize that that was something that Esau needed in his life as well. Need not abandon, none of us need not abandon ourselves to discouragement or despair. And clearly Esau was discouraged, was feeling despair. But that the opposite is true in our walk with the Lord. We need not abandon ourselves to those feelings, to those distorted thoughts of discouragement and despair. There is hope for you. There is hope for me in Christ. That is a true thought. God does not bid us overcome in our own, our own strength. And I uh, love all of the promises in the Bible that, that come, you know, that, that are rich with that word strength. And it's rich in that it's God's strength, not our strength. Overcome. I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Well, he overcame it for us to enjoy overcoming with him through us, not us doing it on our own with him having said, you know, hey, I've done it. You can do it too. No, it's actually I've done it and I'm going to do it through you. And so we can hang on to those promises of his strength. He asks us to come close to his side. So whatever difficulties we labor under, whatever weight uh, is pulling our heart and our mind, our soul and body down. He waits to make us free. And so these are some true thoughts that um, pop up to me as I was going through this story. Now, I'm actually going to add a little bit more to this with um, some thoughts that I want to add here. And uh, just, you know, just want to keep us moving here. Uh, let's talk about going a little deeper with this story now. So what is the spiritual key that turned disappointment into appointment? <clears throat> now, I think it's really interesting that Esau lusted for a favorite dish. Lentils was his favorite dish. And he sacrificed his birthright to gratify appetite. And I, that's a huge disappointment. I mean, as parents, as a parent, I would be heartbroken if one of mine decided to trade in what I have worked hard to give them as their inheritance to gratify an appetite. That would be disappointing for me. And I think that ultimately they would recognize that disappointment in that choice for themselves. After his lustful appetite had been gratified, he saw his folly, but found no space for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. There are many like who are, who are like Esau, 
He represents a class who have a special, valuable blessing within their reach. The immortal inheritance. Life that is as enduring as the life of God, the creator of the universe. Happiness immeasurable and an eternal weight of glory. But who have so long indulged their appetites, passions, and inclinations that their power to discern and appreciate the value of eternal things is weakened. So there's the disappointment, a weakening of the eternal in the heart and mind of Esau. And do I allow myself to be weakened by some of the choices of gratifying the things that I hunger and thirst for that aren't of Christ? That each one would become the head of a mighty nation. That one would be greater than the other. And the younger would have the preeminence. So there is a key phrase, okay? Esau and Jacob were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance. For it included not only an, an inheritance of worldly wealth, but a spiritual preeminence, like I have uh, alluded to earlier. He who received it was to be the priest of the family, and in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. So there, there was a, a reason why this was extra special in, in that spiritual element. They were looking for the, the, the redeemer to come through that line, whoever had the spiritual inheritance. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright, and he who should inherit its blessings must devote his life to the service of God. In marriage, in his family relations, in public life, he must consult the will of God. And Jacob had learned from his mother that the birthright would fall to him um, and that he was filled with desire for the privileges it would confer. It was not his father's wealth that he craved. So um, that's interesting that that was not what his heart was really desiring. It was the spiritual birthright that was the object of his longing to commune with God as Abraham, to offer the sacrifice of atonement, to be the progenitor of the chosen people, the promised Messiah, to inherit the immortal possessions embraced in the covenant. Here were the privileges and honor that kindled his ardent desires. And those are uh, all inform uh, all. Um, deeper insights given to us by one of my favorite authors, Mrs. White. And so if you want to read even uh, more surrounding the story, I encourage you to do that. God often brings us men in crisis, men and women, I shouldn't leave out the women, <laughs> to a crisis that show them, them their own weaknesses. It's good for us to see this actually and to point them to the source of strength. Like I referred to earlier, Jesus is the overcomer and he is our strength. If they pray and watch unto prayer, fighting bravely, their weak points will become their strong points. And those are awesome spiritual key pieces turning disappointments into appointments. We can take what is a disappointment and make that an appointment. That can become our strength. Whatever is the weakness, when we take it to God in prayer, that becomes a strength. That becomes an appointment. Jacob's experience contains many valuable lessons for us. God taught Jacob that in his own strength, he could never gain the victory that he must wrestle with God for strength from above. So how he gained uh, his inheritance by that deception, by, well, he didn't deceive in that moment and everything, but he was definitely taking advantage of his brother. But that was through his own strength. He used his own abilities to get that blessing, to get that inheritance. And he needed to recognize that God was going to give it to him in his way, in his time. 
when after his sin and deceiving Esau, Jacob fled from his father's home. So we have a continuation of the story. And if you remember, um, you know, it kind of created a dynamic in the family that was filled with conflict and, and just probably a little too intense to be home uh, for comfort. And so a lot of times what we do when we're uncomfortable, emotionally stressed, we run, we take off when sometimes we don't physically do that, but sometimes we emotionally do that. And so think about how that might be playing out as you're listening to this part as well. So Jacob fled from his father's home, weighed down with a sense of guilt, lonely and outcast as he was, separated from all that he, that had made life dear. The one thought, thought okay, the one thought that above all others pressed upon his soul was that the fear that his sin had cut him off from God that he was forsaken of heaven. Now, how many of us, myself included, allow ourselves to do something that then as we process it and see what is what we've really done, we fear our anxiety, our, we become depressed. We fear that we've been cut off from God as a result of a choice we have made. In his sadness, he lay down to rest on the bare earth. Around him were only the lonely hills and above in the heaven bright stars. He slept a strange, he slept. And as the strange light broke through his vision, lo, from the plain on which he lay, vast shadowy stairs seemed to lead upward to the very gates of heaven. And upon them, angels of God were passing up and down. While from the glory above, the divine voice was heard in a message of comfort and hope. So Jacob is having his own experience of disappointment. Okay. That disappointment of feeling cut off from God, of having lost his place with God. And here God is giving him an appointment. Let's listen some more. Thus was made known to Jacob that which met the need and longing of his soul. I know we all have a hunger and a thirst, a longing in our soul for what God is, is uh, wanting to do in our lives. And uh, we want to hear, we want to know what that is from our Savior. The joy and gratitude he saw revealed a way by which he, a sinner, could be restored to communion with God. The mystic ladder of his dream represented Jesus the only medium of communication between God and man. Jesus is our answer. Jesus was Jacob's answer. Jesus was Esau's answer. That is the spiritual key, the spiritual key that takes disappointment into appointment. Listen to this. God pardons all who comes. He justly condemns all who do not make Christ their personal savior, but he pardons every soul who comes to him in faith and enables him to work the works of God and through faith to be one with Christ. The Lord has made every provision whereby man may have full and free salvation and be complete in him. Again, this is from Mrs. White. God designs that his children shall have the bright beams of the sun of righteousness, that all may have the light of truth. God has provided salvation for the world at infinite cost, infinite cost. I mean, we, we just talked, we've just experienced Easter weekend and remembered the infinite cost of Christ's death, even though the gift of his only begotten son. The apostles ask, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, get this, freely give us all things. That comes from Romans 8.32. Mark that one, because that one's a great reminder of the appointment that God is giving us. He freely gives us all things. He spared not even his own son. So why would he not freely give us all things? 
then if we are not saved, the fault will not be on the part of God, but on our part, that we have failed to cooperate with the divine agencies. Our will has not coincided with God's will. And I don't want to harp on that too much, but I want you to know we do have choices. We do have free will. And at any time we can say, God, please save me. There is hope for all. None need abandon themselves. Remember I said this earlier in the true thinking? None need abandon themselves to discouragement and despair. Okay, I'm going to say that one again. Because we're all anxious. We all get discouraged. We all feel depressed. We all experience these things at different seasons in our life. None need abandon themselves to discouragement and despair. Satan may come to you with the cruel suggestion. And let me remind you, whatever he is pushing on you is a distorted thought, is the father of lies coming at you. Yours is a hopeless case, he says. You are irredeemable. No. No, 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 my friends. That is a distorted thought. But there is hope for you in Christ. That is the true thought. Okay? Always remember that, no matter what. God does not bid us to overcome in our strength. He asks us to come close to his side. Whatever difficulties we labor under, which weigh down the soul and body, he waits to make us free. So let's apply this a little more deeply in our day to day. Okay. So like I said, I struggle with this all or nothing thinking myself. And here's, here's something that comes straight to my heart. All or nothing thinkers are often very perfectionistic. If they can't do something well, they'd rather not do it at all. Hmm. I think I'm right there on that one. If a situation doesn't go perfectly, they feel like an abject failure. Even the goals that such thinkers set for themselves are measured in absolute terms. Okay, so listen to this piece um, coming up. You can, it really, really is, is very um, insightful to understand how you pull that all or nothing thinking perfectionism. Okay, so perfectionism is really a distortion of the challenge to do your best. In the person who believes his or her best must always, okay, and that word always is key, always mean perfect, okay, perfect. You have, you can't, there's no gray, there's no growing stages, there's no um, learning piece to it. It's like you already have to know it. The individual becomes fearful of making mistakes and may experience stress, anxiety disorders, and depression as a result. Okay, so think about how that all or nothing thinking leads you to then feeling more anxious, feeling depressed, feeling stressed, okay? While there's nothing wrong with pursuing perfection, so we definitely wanted to, um, you know, to understand that there's nothing wrong with pursuing doing your best. We must be reasonable in our expectations. While we should always strive for, hope for, and desire the best, okay? We want to do our very best. It is unrealistic to believe that we and everything we do will be met with smashing success. No, oh, like everything you touch is gold. Well, not necessarily, and it's okay. The reality is that much of life happens in that messy gray area between the black and white and most things in life have a middle ground and actually that's a very relieving um, mindset to have that you don't have to do everything perfectly as long as you're doing your very best it is good it is it is um, freeing to know that you don't have to be perfect that that your worth is not based on being perfect all or nothing thinkers like to simplify the wor world by putting everything into extremes or absolutes like black and white, good or bad, up and down. Okay. So think about that. Is that something that you do? Is that something that someone you know or love do? They also tend to speak in sweeping terms like I'm right and she's wrong about this or my project was totally ruined by that mistake. Ever thought about 
this day is totally awful when it was just the one thing for 30 minutes of the day that happened that was not a great experience. But all of a sudden, for some reason, it makes the whole, the whole day is awful. Okay. To the person struggling with all or nothing thinking, there are only two choices. Think about this. Magnificent or awful. Caught in a cycle of rigid thinking. Okay, this is very rigid thinking. They cheat themselves out of a great deal of happiness by failing to see the vast gray area in which most of life takes place. So you cheat yourself out of a fulfilling life, out of a joyful life. I cheat myself when I put myself in that position, that thought process. When we do that black and white thinking, that all or nothing, good or bad. So here's some strategies that I want to, to start wrapping up our time together with. Here are some strategies that I want you guys to think about using. You don't have to, but hey, you never know what might come in handy. Or if you know somebody that might be um, benefit, benefit from this idea, you can pass it along. So and becoming more aware of the thoughts that you're thinking, uh, because now that you've heard what all or nothing thinking is like, uh, maybe you're going, oh, that's what I do. I do that then. And then as you go through the day and through the next several days and through the next weeks and everything, it'll start to, to ring, you know, oh, there's that all or nothing thinking. I didn't realize I had that actually. And now I see that I've got that and, and that's okay. So here we're going to figure out how to, how to deal with that. Okay. So on cards you can put all or worth all or nothing words that you might find yourself frequently saying so here are some words that you might actually say or that you have heard others say the word always never must everything nothing useless horrible terrible awful totally and completely I can think of a couple of stories, you know, children's books that talk about Alexander's horrible, awful, terrible day. And that was very much an all or nothing thinking story. So if you have that in your library, you can look that one up and see. If you think of similar words that are in your regular vocabulary, then add them to the list as well. And then for a period of several days, keep track of how often you say those words. Okay, so... Think about, you know, are you saying those words or are you thinking in shades of gray? And so to put this into action, try evaluating things on a scale ranging from zero to 100. That's just one idea, okay? You don't have to do this, but, you know, an idea. And if something doesn't turn out as you'd hope, try thinking of it as a partial success instead of a total failure, okay? See what was good about it. See what was um, something that went right about it or was better than you expected even. More often than not, there is something you can learn from the situation. In any experience that you have learned something valuable from, no matter how difficult, should not be ranked as an abject failure, okay? So, you know, learning is a growing process and just because we're not in school anymore for some of us does not mean we're not continuing to learn. And I think that is the fabulous thing about God's gift to us in our retraining our brain is that this is a lifelong journey of, of being able to grow and improve and grow closer to him and to, and to understand things better. So, you know, if you see that you've been in this all or nothing thinking, just award yourself the diploma of the school of hard knocks. And, uh, and just know that if nothing can be done to undo the situation, learn from it, move on from it. Be gracious to yourself. Be patient with yourself. And if you know that you're having this struggle with all or nothing thinking and you catch yourself doing it, don't beat yourself up. Just say, okay, now I know I'm going to practice this now and go from here. It's important for us to, to accept our imperfection. An important key to overcoming distorted all or nothing thinking is to forgive yourself for minor lapses in behavior, to learn from your mistakes and, and to know that we are going to be, as humans, weak. The Christian worldview recognizes that people make mistakes and we even, you know, have a way of being able to reconcile ourselves with God and to confess 
our mistakes and to take that to him and just leave it at his feet. Take those burdens to him. He he wants you. He wants me to, to take them and to bring them to him and to be forgiven for those things that we've done. So in addition to adopting this less, con this less condemning thought process, it's important to also avoid making absolute promises that place you one step away from failure. Okay. So don't create unbalanced goals or rigid schedules um, that those tend to trigger uh, binge reactions to then slipping into those distorted thoughts. And you can avoid those reactions by ensuring that your goals are reasonable and obtainable. Okay. So just, you know, evaluate, assess, make sure that it's, it's realistic and, and don't put more on yourself than you need to in this. In many life situations, the rational way to set goals is to allow for gradual process and progress and change and to make goals more flexible. Okay. You'll also want to apply some careful, careful analyst. Uh, I can't speak right now for some reason, careful analysis to your personal relationships. So think about how this is affecting your relationships with those that you love, uh, your friendships, maybe even your colleagues. Um, if there are people in your life that you have ranked as perfect or evil, it would be wise to rethink that stance. Okay. And while it's certainly hard to find any redeeming characteristics in some hardened criminals, chances are good that the vast majority of who you know fall somewhere between perfect and perfectly evil on the all or nothing scale. <laughs> So adopting a realistic attitude that recognizes both the strengths and weaknesses of those in our lives, we need to recognize that not only in ourselves, but in others as well, can do much to strengthen those relationships and is particularly helpful when we are in the romance section of those relationships. And there are some other distorted thoughts that really um, are very good for relationship pieces uh, we are going to get to as we continue through the series. So if that is something that kind of piques your interest, just know that that is coming. And uh, just it's important to remind yourself the law of the mind. Okay. Thoughts repeated become thoughts deeply embedded. So repetition is our friend. Okay. So if you've noticed that these are things that you struggle with, you know, things that I struggle with, then you figure out a way to practice new thoughts, true thoughts. And that is what becomes the new pathway in your brain. So thoughts repeated become thoughts deeply embedded. So to practice this, here's four steps I want you to think about. To identify and correct thinking errors and negative automatic thoughts. So the first one is, hear your internal dialogue. What are you thinking? Okay. This is to, this is not about what you are feeling because that's a different section of this and we'll get to that later, but what are you thinking? Number two, and analyze your internal dialogue. Okay. There might be some, uh, some tapes that you grew up with, uh, maybe some things that you picked up from, uh, those who were important people in your life. Um, and, and kind of trained you to think a certain way. Maybe you picked up their own distorted thinking about themselves and out of um, just mimicking and, and uh, mirroring, you've created that to be your thought process as well. So identify which cognitive distortions are present. Okay. And again, we'll get to the rest of these as we go along. So maybe all or nothing's not the one that you struggle with, but uh, there will most likely not to, um, not to make you feel too bad, but there will most likely be something else and we will get to those as we keep going. Then the third one is reconstruct your thinking, okay? So this is how you want to, like I said earlier, take the distorted thought, flip it into the true thought. So write true statements to replace distorted thoughts. Writing things down actually um, deepens things, okay? Verbalizing it, speaking it deepens it. And so it, not just to think it and to rethink something true into the true format, you will do better if you write it down, okay? 
or if you speak it. But the writing down seems to be very, very valuable because you can come back to it, refer to it, and see it again. And then that continues to create that repetitious um, thought uh, correcting. All right, so then the fourth one, which is, again, I talked about repetition as a friend. <clears throat> practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the easier it gets to eliminate distorted thinking. Ooh, and I ended up with something in my throat. Okay. So, what are you thinking? Identify the distortion that is present. Write the true statement, the true thought, and then practice, practice, practice. And I know I said this before, <clears throat> but I think it's worth repeating. It will cost a determined effort. Okay. You have to be intentional. It will cost a determined effort to change the current of our thoughts, but the change can be made. Our happiness. Okay. I'm including myself in this. Our happiness for this life and for the life to come depends on us fixing our minds upon cheerful things, true thoughts. Let us look away from the dark picture, the distorted thoughts that Satan is trying to keep us bound and imprisoned in, which is imaginary, distorted thought, to the benefits which God has strewn upon our pathway. He's given us so much. Let us look to that and look beyond these dark things that the world holds to the unseen, to the eternal, to the heavenly. And again, I want to encourage the daily focus. Colossians 3 verse 2. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And that is our first distorted thinking, all or nothing. I hoped, I hope that it was a blessing to you to hear, and hopefully, uh, you were able to glean some good information, whether it's for yourself or someone else that you know and love. And we will see you again next time for the next distorted thought process and Bible story to study. Many blessings to you and yours. Don't forget to subscribe. And let's close in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now. And we give you all the honor and glory for speaking to our hearts during this time. And helping us to see what you need us to see of distorted thinking. Of the lies that Satan has tried to take a hold of us in. And I just ask that you intervene in my life in their lives in a mighty way to retrain our brain and to fix our eyes on you and to think true thoughts. You are our one true God and we know that you can do all things, that there is nothing impossible with you. And so we give this to you and thank you in advance for changing our lives as a result of true thinking. And then help us to apply this, to see the appointments that you have in store for us. Thank you for turning our disappointments into appointments. Thank you for taking whatever choices we have made, knowingly or unknowingly, that have created disappointments. Thank you for turning them into appointments and drawing us closer to you, ultimately. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. I look forward to seeing you next time. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.